to a life transforming experience as Pastor Prince Abbott brings you God's word with deep insights and power. God bless you. He is the goal of His presence. It's not even goal of anything else to achieve. It's not building. It's not buying cars. The first goal for me is the goal of His glory. If you will master it, I wish I was here to talk to you about it. If you will master how to be a carrier of God's glory. If you will master how to build a tabernacle, a mobile dwelling place for God. You're going to go all over the world. Maybe somewhere this year, God helping me, I'm going to come back again. To do something with the entirety of the Jesus here. There is something going on in these last days now. It looks like young people are not in the know. God is about. Can you just change this mindset? I need a better mic, please, if you can. And what is in my heart more than anything else is to hook this generation to what God is doing in the end time, in the last days. Joel chapter 2 said, in the last days I will pour. I will pour. You know what it means to pour? There's a difference between scooping water in a little boil and pouring on your body. I don't know if you've ever taken your bath with all those small cups and it gets to a point, especially at the point you're trying to round up taking your bath. You drop the cup. You know, especially when you're starting, you're scooping water from your cup and all that. But when you get to that point where you're about to round up, I did it and sometimes I still do it. You drop the scooper, you drop that cup, collect the whole bucket and what? Has it happened to you? Has it happened to you? That's what God is doing in the last days. He's no longer scooping the thing, he's pouring it out. I don't know if I'm talking to the right people here. There's a measure of anointing, of outpouring of grace, of His presence, of His glory, of His person. It's going on in your age, in your time, but not so many persons are catching up with it. We're going to leave that one for when I come next. It's going to be an amazing meeting. I'm going to come back. Where's your chest here? Hello, sir. I... To all the campus leaders who are here, all the presidents and pastors, my show is over. It's time for God to show. The era of competition in the church is over. The era of envy and jealousy, competition or healthy, whatever, it ended long time ago. God long moved from that. It's unfortunate that some people are still struggling over things I don't understand. The church today is the hub of disunity. The church today is the hub of all kinds of nonsense. Demons are infect, infesting our brethren. All kinds of issues going on. The harvest is plenty every day. Laborers are few. The church has become a hub of gossip, a hub of slander, murmuring, and all kinds of things. No unity in the church. Look at your campus. You know, a meeting like this, I expect this whole place to jam to the brim. And jam even beyond these premises. When the world organizes their own program, you see what happens. They jam the whole place. The world seems to understand compression more than the church. I hear that in this campus you compete a lot. You know, I'm a young man, but God has put the mantle of fatherhood on me. So there are things I would say that some of you cannot say with your whatever. So one of the things I'm going to do for your administration is to unite the church on this campus. Unite the body of Christ. So we are going to be coming back with a revival summit here. Watch what is going to happen. There's too much of motivational speaking now in the church and then we have zero degree of God's power, of God's move, of God's presence. 
that's one of the things I'm going to come back to address. This outpouring of the Spirit of God. When true revival come, people, people are melted. People are broken. People are contract. People reconsecrate themselves. People go back to, you know, sanctification. People go back to the cross. People go back to some salient things that made men rule their world in their time. We have to take you back to history and show you what men like the Charles Finney, Catherine Kuma. It's unfortunate that we have a lot of people in church that don't have any knowledge about what God did with previous generations. We don't know the God that made water come out of the rock. I heard about the story of a particular, you know, God's general who took the city to preach. And after preaching, he said for 15 years, alcohol is shut down in the city. Just for preaching. In a revival, you know, we organize revival meetings that people come to church and cry, and after that, people go back home. No change in our society, no change in our campus. That's not revival. Revival leaves an impact on society. The end result of revival is reformation of communities, reformation of that's my major assignment, even this year and the whole of this decade. It's not church as usual, it's now church unusual. We are going back to the real element of our Christian faith. And then if you are a leader in the JCCF here, I don't know. Maybe God will give me an opportunity to talk with you guys at the end of this meeting tonight. I told you about that. Five minutes, ten minutes. Let's put heads together and see how we can steal this fire one more time in your time. Let's get back that as a street revival back on the campuses. That move, that move. Let's get it back on the campus. There's too much of normalcy everywhere now. Too much of coldness everywhere. Now. How can you be in a meeting like this and people are walking around the street? No, those days where we used to see fire on the campus. You don't need posters and flyers. Once we open worship like this, people start leaving their hostels and they are looking for that venue. That's what used to happen those days. I witnessed a little of that. Now the struggle is about membership. It's about leave this church and come to my church. Leave this fellowship and come to my fellowship. That's not what God called us here to do. In the days of His power, the Bible says, the people shall be one, willing. Let's go back to the real thing. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, maybe that's my first message. You know, for those who need it. Amen. Amen. Good evening. God bless you. It's so nice to see you again. How many of you are first year students? Congratulations on your matriculation. Let's appreciate the first year students for clapping. Hallelujah. And I want to appreciate all the leaders here, all the pastors. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful, you know. Thank you, Mr. President. Let's appreciate your leaders, appreciate your president. Amen. And thank you, your President Emeritus. Can we appreciate that young man, you know? Pastor, God bless you. Thank you for coming. I came with a couple of people, God's generals and men who are being raised in this same time. Thank you for coming with me. Thank you. Let's appreciate them. They came all the way to be part of this program. Hallelujah. We have had a long, long day already. I'm going to take 10 minutes and share some things with you and then we'll be out. Please do have your seat briefly. Three kinds of life. I'll uh, just on that and then we're out. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He played the song. Our Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in know the end. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people, we declare. Blessed be the Lord Almighty Who was and is and is to come Blessed be Who reigns forever? Who reigns forever? Oh, 
okay and hearing in my spirit you know who reigns forevermore who reigns forever who reigns forevermore who reigns It's all true. Just play like that all true. Who reigns forevermore? Who reigns forevermore? Okay, it is Isaiah chapter 12. Let me read from this one quickly. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, why the evil days come not, nor the years draw near, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Why the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Anytime I have the opportunity of speaking to young people, I am always excited. I don't take it for granted because you are the future. The future of the kingdom is in you. You are the generation actually that will meet the appearing of Jesus. You are the future of Africa. You're the future of the church. A few years ago, even up to last year, we started witnessing the transition of some generals. Heavy transitions. And there are many more that will happen this year. I hope you know this year is a leap year. Okay, I won't talk to you about what the leap year, you know, what happens during the leap year and all that. Maybe when we come for Revival Summit, we will do that with you. Last year, we had the transition of one of those generals. Rehad Bonk, one man who single handedly won over a hundred million souls, over a hundred million souls to Jesus, one man who shook the entire Africa and brought it to his hands. We witnessed the transition of another general called Abraham. I want to challenge you to go back and start studying, especially if you're in ministry, if you're a minister, if you're a young person in ministry, go back into history and start studying what God did with all these men. They were all young people when they were picked up. Where donkey gave his life to Jesus at the age of eight. He died at the age of 79, is that correct? But from a very young age, he shook the entire places. He shook Africa. I remember two of his crusades, I was mass choir director. The two of his major crusades, it was phenomenal. Before I got into ministry as a pastor and all, I used to do music full time. I used to see the passion with which he preaches. I see the gods. I see the flow of God's power, the anointing, and I like God raised such men in my time. You read about Billy Graham. You study about his works. A preacher of righteousness. A preacher of integrity. A preacher of holiness. He preached salvation. And many others like the T.L. Osborne's and the rest of them. T.L. Osborne was 17 years. His wife was 16 years when they got married. And then their honeymoon was a takeoff to India. At the time India was still the hub of witchcraft and all kinds of things. And they shook India. Before the man passed on, he planted over 150,000 churches. He will go to nations with books, him and his wife, Daisy lost one. Young people, shaking the whole places and disturbing territories, casting out demons and witches out of. What about our, one of our contemporary generals, though he has passed on, Papa Idahosa? Most of you didn't meet him, but I know you've heard about him. The list is endless. These are men whose records 
the wind of life cannot blow away from the sand of time. These are men who stand out even in heaven. When you go to heaven, there are people who will stand out. There are some who will be lost in the crowd. Maybe you don't know. There's some of you think when we go to heaven, everybody is equal in heaven. Everybody is going to be giving equal handshake. It's not true. There are people who are going to really stand out. They are going to have crowns, all kinds of crowns. There's some who have a whole estate allocated to them. Very significant people. I know how hard it is if I tell you now your destiny is to be a good man here on earth. You're going to even slap me. If I tell you your destiny is to be a gardener on earth, you're going to even throw hot water on me if you want. Do you know if you go to heaven, you will see gardeners and they are human beings who were once on earth. Yes. You're going to see horticulturists. You're going to see gatekeepers. So don't let anybody confuse you with all the kind of gospel going on here. That when you get there, everything is whatever. No. There are people who will go there and do linear jobs. Because when they look through their record, they will find tangible works that was done in the life in their lifetime to you know impact on the kingdom and impact on society. When you go to heaven, they are not going to tell you welcome. They are going to tell you well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's not going to be a welcome. You are going to be rewarded based on what you did. Are you hearing what I'm saying? about so many men who shook the world but in Christendom and even in the secular world I read about the likes of Martin Luther King Jr I read about the likes of Winston Churchill I read about the likes of Mother Teresa I read about heroes the likes of Mary Slayson social reformers people who changed the landscape of the world one of my daughters who came here also, you know, she's sitting behind. She's a twin. One time I was speaking, I said, imagine Mary Slater was not born. That's why. Imagine she did not fulfill her ministry. Imagine she did not carry that burden of coming to Calabar, Nigeria, Africa, and advocated against the killing of twins. That means you would have been long dead. If they were giving birth to you, they would have been killing you. So you are a twin and you are alive today because somebody fulfilled her purpose. Somebody fulfilled her ministry. Somebody understood the reason why she was born. I'm talking to you about the three kinds of life. Number one, because I don't have the time to waste. Because when you leave this world, you're going to fall into either of these categories. I'm addressing majorly the first year students. I don't know, most of you think you came here to school, but uh, there's life beyond school. We can teach you academic success. I can teach you relationship success. We can teach you how to pass your exams, make powerful GPs, and all that. You know, some of you came here to make two one. You came here to make first class, as powerful as that is. But that's what I'm here to talk to you about, sir. You need to achieve that, and I must very sincerely need to have that. But let me shock you. There are many people who have two ones and first class who are useless in this world. Many of them, I've met a lot of them. Some PhD holders, some professors who are useless. I know professors who cannot keep their home. I know professors who are all, I mean, you see their children. You don't want to have that kind of life. God said, they're talking to me about this thing called life outside school. I did a whole book titled 21 Things You Must Do Before You Graduate. And none of them has to do with your school, whatever. Because why school will teach you what to know, this gospel which will give you an essence for life, an essence for living. It's going to give you a purpose for living. There's something beyond being able to read and write. There's something beyond being able to solve mathematics. There's something beyond being able to calculate equations. There's something beyond econometrics and biometrics and all that. That thing is called a life of purpose. And then, coming to campus is one of the greatest advantage you have now to find and start fulfilling your purpose. For people like me, started even in secondary school. But the team blows up when I got into school. 
what I'm currently doing is not a mistake, it's not an accident. It's something that deliberately started off. I didn't just stumble into it. What I'm doing is something I know I'm wired for. Something God created me to do. It's not something I'm guessing. And then I found it early in school. Part of it, secondary school. But majority of it was discovered and harnessed while I was on campus. You know, I tell people, university is simply a city in the universe. Everything your world will look like, you can create it here on campus. You can start the journey to a blissful world here on campus. You can also start the journey to a world of sorrow and regret here on campus. Campus has power to determine your future. Maybe you don't know. So for those of you who did matriculation yesterday, you are excited. That's just the entry point. That's just your input phase. The journey has just begun. For some of you, it's a four-year journey. For some of you, it's a five-year journey. For some of you, it's a six-year journey, depending on the course you're reading. But when you finally get done from this place, your input here will determine your output outside school. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? The first kind of life is what you call the invested life. The invested life. The invested life. The invested life. How many of you know that your life is like a capital? Life is like a resource. In fact, it's not even life. Life is a resource itself. The same way you can invest a resource, like money for instance. If I give you 10,000 now, do you know you can be a, you're a potential millionaire? Depending on what you do with 10,000. And you are welcome. Hello? The uncle Tay is the richest man in Africa, is that correct? I heard his story. He said his uncle gave him 500,000. That was what he used to start the whole conglomerate. He's a billionaire today. I think he's the third richest man in the whole world or so. How did he get there? With just 500,000. That was a capital. If he invested it wrongly, he would not be where he is now. So, it, 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 all you need is just a seed. Life itself is a seed. Do you know you can have a whole forest or a whole orchard of mangoes with just one seed? One seed. You can create a whole forest of mangoes worth billions of naira. But you just planted one seed. It is said that the world has about 7.9 or 7.2 billion people. Of course, you know there are more than that. But statistically on paper, they say we are 7.2 billion people in the whole world. Where did the whole 7.2 billion people come from? Have you ever asked, where did they come from? From one man. God Adam. God didn't create the whole 7.2 billion people. He created one man and created one woman. Then he put inside that one man the potentials to multiply 7.2 billion people. And even more. Every human being you see on earth came from one loin. You came from Adam, if you don't know. God didn't create two men. He created one. Then he created one woman. But that man is the seed that multiplied into giving birth to all these fruits that you see now. So if Adam had died in the Garden of Eden, the whole creation would have been lost. I don't know if you are catching what I'm saying. If Adam had been attacked by an animal and then he lost his life, that would have been the end of everything. If God decided not to create humans again, you wouldn't have any human being living on this world. Even when God destroyed the first world because of the sin, the rebellion, and all that was going on, he had to preserve Noah, preserved some few species. Remember when he told Noah, take everything in pairs. One lion male, another lion female. Take one goat male, take another goat female. Take one ram male, take another ram female. Why was he doing that? So he can start creation all over again. There's power in seed. 
there's power in seed. That is how your life is. I don't care the kind of family you're born into. I don't care the kind of background you come from. If you understand the power of seed, the seed principle that you are a seed, that how you invest your life now will determine what you reap in your tomorrow. There's a common saying that goes, as a man dresses his bed, so he lies on it. Is that correct? There's another one that you, not, you normally say you know it. You would reap what you sow. Is that correct? That's what life is like. Life is a seed. How you sow life, that means what you reap in life. So the first kind of life is invested life. Life that is rightly invested. And the key indices for measuring an invested life is a life that discovered and fulfilled purpose. Some of you think life is about cars, it's about houses, making money. Of course, that's the madness in our generation now. Everything young people are talking about now is money. You open your TV, uh, music industry is talking about money. You open it, whatever you, money, 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 money. That's what people think life is all about. People think life is about making money. It's about traveling around the world. It's about driving cars. It's about building buildings. But that's not life. Those things come naturally when you understand and fulfill your purpose. You can have all that and die a useless man. You can have all the buildings. You can have all the houses. All the vehicles. And still not make impact in your generation. What is that thing you are born to fulfill? Have you found that? When you hear the story of men that turn the world upside down, do you think they have two heads? The difference between you and them is no school. The difference between you and them is a discovered purpose. They discovered their purpose, their essence for living. I like the theme of the program, the essence. What is your essence here? You're going to school and getting a degree. What more is to your living? What is the original plan of God for your life? Have you found out what it is? You think you're a product of accident? You think you're a product of sex? Maybe you think you are that thing that happened when your mother and your father slept. There's more to you than that. You're deliberate, my friend. You are intentional. God saw a problem in this nation, in your generation. And he fashioned you as the answer to that problem. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? The Bible says in the book of Romans that the earnest expectation of creation is the manifestation of what? The sons of God. Every cry you see in your generation, somebody is designed to solve or to answer. Every problem you see in your society only persists because the person designed to solve that problem is sleeping somewhere. You see this problem of crime in your society, it's not government that will solve it for you. It is you. There's somebody here born to solve the problem of crime. And you don't need to be a pastor to do it. You see the problem of racism in America many years ago. Who solved that problem? Martin Luther King Jr. You know the popular statement, I have a dream. He saw how the whites discriminated the black. He saw how black people entered buses. When they sit down and a white enter, they would tell the black guy to get up for a white person to sit down. That was injustice to humanity. And it gave him concern, it gave him body. And then he championed the cause to end that circle of racism going on in America. You know, he didn't even live to see what he fought for. But even after many years of transition, we still talk about Martin Luther King Jr. The blacks in America, the African Americans, can never write their history without talking about Martin Luther King Jr. Because he championed the cause. What about Nelson Mandela? The problem of apartheid in South Africa. Whites lynching the blacks. Go and read about these things. You'll be so shocked at the things that happen in your history and what men did to solve these problems. Last year we heard about the killings of Nigerians in South Africa. 
and somebody posted on the internet if Nelson Mandela was alive this would not be happening I said he has done his part and gone we need new Nelson Mandela's who is going to be the one to champion causes to solve the problem of prostitution to solve the problem of crime to solve the problem of rape to solve the problem of cultism to solve the problem of broken homes. You know, there are many people who come from broken homes. You, you, you saw the drama. I was blessed by that drama. Tremendously blessed. You see how the devil, you see that thing going on there. It's how it's real. It's real. There are people who wake up every morning with thoughts of suicide. Do you know there are some of you sitting down here. God has deposited an anointing instead of you to solve that problem. Some people who are thinking suicide out of depression only think it because of the kind of home they are coming from. Some is because of the kind of home they are coming from. Some is because of the kind of background they come from. They don't have the kind of life some of you have. Some don't even know their father. Just I, I met a young boy who told me, sir, I was born out of wedlock. The guy who gave my mom whatever, the pregnancy that led to my bed was a criminal, an arm robber. I don't even know who the guy is. My mom abandoned me when I was just only little. I was talking to him about Christ, talking to him about the kingdom, about church. He said, I have lost no hope in that. God does not exist. If God exists, why would he allow me born that way? Why would he allow a man to rape my mother? Why would he allow my mother to abandon me when I was only small? I said, my friend, if, you, if your mom was not raped, you wouldn't have been born. Why not learn to see the positive side out of this problem? Do you hear complaining if God loves me? Why would he allow me to be born this way? Maybe that was the only way destiny would have orchestrated your being born. And who knows if God allowed you to be born that way so you can have a ministry out of it. Because there are many people who are living like that who were born out of wedlock somewhere, raped and they were, that's the reason they came here. And then you are the one God wants to take through that process, get you to have an experience, clean you up and send you back to that sector to go and do ministry there. And that's how you're going to be a well-meaning fellow. There's a young man called Nick. He has no arms. He has no legs. Born abnormal. You need to see him when he's put on, you know, platforms like this. They carry him, put him up there. And he's talking to thousands of young people. Talking to thousands. I heard his story. Very amazing story. How did he come by that ministry? He used to be in school and then anytime he comes to school, he feels abnormal. He had this rejection problem. He had depression. People saw him as an abnormal child. His classmates made jest of him. And he thought of, oh no Lord, you don't love me. Why, why must I be born this way? And then he said he went to the scripture and he saw something that changed his mindset. For all things work it together. For the good of them that love God. He said, eh? God, are you saying all things, including this one? God said, yes. He said, there are many people like you. They have complete arms. They have complete legs. But they are incomplete inside. He said, I created you incomplete outside. But I want to make you complete inside. So when you now begin to do ministry, people who are complete outside and incomplete inside, we see how a man who is not complete outside is healthy on the inside. So I'm going to send you with a message of hope, a message of restoration. You're not going to go and be healing like Benny Hinn is doing. The one is not going to be doing uh, crusades like Rehad Bonki is doing. You don't have any business with that. Yours is to go to people who have depression problems. Yours is to go to people who have rejection problems. Yours is to go to people who are coming from broken homes, who want to take their life. Use your story to inspire them. I've watched different video clips of that guy speaking on different platforms. And you need to see people crying themselves. Why? Invested life. And some of you who are not born to preach like I'm preaching. Even me who is a preacher, I'm multifaceted. There are times I do the supernatural, I know when to drop supernatural and healings. And I get into issues of wisdom and knowledge. Into issues of training and all of all that. Some of you are not born to heal any sick person. Some of you are born to heal sick souls. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leaves me beside tea waters. What was the next one? Can we say it together? Do you know that's a different ministry? 
Restoring people's soul is a different ministry entirely from healing bodies that are sick. There are some of you here who have the ministry of the restoration of people's soul. When a man loses his soul, he can think of suicide. And it's one of the prevailing things going on in your generation now, 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 now. I've met countless number of such people. All they think about is how to take this life. If you don't discover what you're born for, society will wail in anguish. As you go through this phase of your life, the best thing you can do is to begin that voyage of discovery. Why am I born? Why am I alive? To what end is my creation? Am I another census count? Am I another statistics on census paper? Am I just one of those guys who wake up in the morning, walk around with no aim, no purpose, no direction? A woman who has not found a purpose can open her legs for anybody. Finding out the purpose for your living is what gives your life direction. Everything would appeal to you. Everything won't go for you. Everything will not appeal to you. Everything will not go for you. That's what is going to give you discipline even while you're on campus. It's a life of essence. The essence of life and the purpose of life is to find problems around you and begin to solve them. Anything that is not solving a problem is useless. I give an example. I'm talking with a mic now. And you can hear this mic has no reason to be in my hand. Cannot be. If it can't produce sound, is that correct? Hello? Some of you are wearing clothes and you're looking fine. A few minutes back, I was telling Pastor Kev, I said, You're looking very beautiful. This is your cloth is awesome. You need to get your tailor to do this for me. I have no reason to appreciate this cloth. It is not solving a problem. I wear a wristwatch. I have no reason to wear the wristwatch if it's not solving a problem. I use a mobile phone. What does he help me do? To make calls, receive calls, maybe send SMSs, do some research and all that. Because it's solving a problem. That's why I use it. Everything you see solves a problem. The chair you're sitting on now is solving a problem. This fan is solving a problem. The speaker is solving a problem. Even things that are in an image are solving problems. How much more you created in the image and the likeness of God? Which problem are you here to solve? We've seen enough young people complaining about problems. You know, how young men are distracted. All kinds of issues everywhere. Look at the rate of unemployment in this country now. Actually, I don't have any problem with your government for not creating jobs. You're the one to create jobs. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? I say you are the one that will create jobs. Because when you find your purpose, that's the job already. They did screen, the EFCC screen in Enugu a few days ago, and then they said it was more than 10,000 people who were there to apply for a job that doesn't exist. My friend, you're carrying a job inside you. Find what that job is and begin to solve that problem. Begin to fulfill that. And most of you are here to graduate and carry CVs and start looking for jobs. I know some of you will get jobs. Nobody says you should go and look for a job. You need to look for a job if you need to. But when you're looking for a job, you need to find something to live for. Work exists in two dimensions. The first side of work is doing something to earn a living. That's one. But the second dimension of work is doing something to earn a giving. So if all you're living for is earning a living, you are just irrelevant. You need to find that thing that makes you earn a giving. That thing that makes you contribute to your society. That makes you contribute to the kingdom. Time will fail me to talk about purpose today. But that's how we know you have invested your life. Find that problem. And how do you discover it? You discover it in God. God is your source. You are His product. You came from Him. Nobody can tell you what you are born here to do until you are connected with the Creator. He's the one that designed you. Just like a product cannot be telling its manufacturer what it is designed for. It is a manufacturer that describes the use of the product, that describes the purpose of the product. Your manufacturer is God. That's so why you can't talk about purpose without talking about God. Maybe you're here, you're not born again. You're not going to fulfill purpose until you have found your roots.
until you have found your source and begin to ask him lord show me my own blueprint show me my own script jeremiah chapter one clearly said it before you were born i knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb i had already ordained you to be a priest and a prophet to the nations go and find out that perfect blueprint God has for you, even before your creation, even before you were formed in your mother's womb, go and ask him seek him in prayers Lord show me, I don't just want to live life and exist without notice show me that thing that will make me relevant in my time, show me that thing that will make me a contributor in my age, show me that thing that will make me an answer to the cries of people, like God can come to Moses and tell him, I have heard the cry of my people in Egypt. Now go and deliver them. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Tell him I'm taking them out of this place to a land that flows with milk and honey. The day Moses found that calling, he stopped keeping sheep. The day he found that purpose, he stopped settling for little. And he took a mandate upon his life. Maybe Moses would, have, would, would, would not have been written about or talked about if he didn't fulfill his mandate on earth. There's so many others we can talk about. That's how you are. You are a greater than a Moses sitting down here. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Don't look down on yourself. I don't care that you are born in the house of a pamwenta or a farmer or whatever you call it. There is more to you. You're the one God created to solve that problem that have been that have existed age long. You're the one God designed to meet that problem that has defied all solutions. You're the one God designed to solve that problem even in your own family. There are some of you whose family will never have a name until you rise and begin to shine. Yes, it's true. My daddy is poor. My mommy is poor. Forget that nonsense. You're the one who will give your daddy a name. Some of you, we don't know your village. But because of you, you will know your village. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? Number two kind of life. Spent life. Spent life. These are people who just exist with no purpose on their life. They wake up to eat. They wake up to bath. They wake up to dress up. And they wake up to go out. Loafing around the place. No purpose. No mandate. No direction. Spent life. These are Methuselahs. You know the Bible talked about Methuselah. He lived the 900 and something years. Is that correct? And he died. There was no record about any meaningful thing he did in his time. But you know Jesus lived for 33 years and he shook the world. Do you know that? 33 years. And that man lived 900 and something years and then that's the only thing that was recorded about him and he died. No place in the Bible is recorded where Methuselah touched anybody's life. But Jesus lived 33, died and shook the whole world. And he did ministry for just three years only, or three and a half years. Okay, what about Martin Luther? 39 years he died. We're not saying you're going to die young. All I'm saying is that your life is not measured in your duration, but in your donation. Your life is not measured in what you are eating or what you are. It's measured in what you are giving. Us. So your life will not make any meaning. It, all it does is wake up and then, you know, live your life like every other person is living it. You know, just repeating cycle. Go to class, struggle to write quiz, struggle to pass your exams. And then if we ask you, what is your seven year plan? You can't tell us. What is your 20 year plan? You can't tell us. Before 2020 commenced, we wrote the whole plan for this year. The whole plan for 2020 has been written. I think I sent you a copy. There's a program he's trying to even get me to do. I told him, review my calendar and check if there's any space there. This year alone, I'm going to be in the U.S. twice. Atlanta, Georgia, and then, uh, what's the other one? New York. I'm going to be in Rwanda. I'm going to be in uh, Uganda. I'm going to be in Ghana. I'm going to be in Kenya. I'm going to be in Dubai. About eight different countries already written. The dates have already been slated. The tickets have already been paid for. Because that's an invested life. Not just 2020, the entire decade. When I mean decade, 10 years, that's what I mean. From 2020 to 2030, already scripted.
You already speak. That's what a life of purpose would make you do. The Bible said, teach us to number our days. That we may incline our hearts to what? To wisdom. I didn't come here to preach. I came here to counsel you. That's why I'm not screaming. There are many preachers of you fathers. I will talk to you as a father will talk. It's not the preaching I came here to do. Do you know the most of you here don't know what 2020 will look like when it ends? I already know how my 2020 will look like. My pastor told me that the prince, before every April, I have already achieved all my New Year goals. He shook me. He said, before every April, I have all my New Year goals achieved. All the prayers I said for the year, answer. So as I set New Year goals in January, and I set New Year goals in April again. He said, for me, it's like every quarter I set a new year. For me, the year didn't start in January. The year started for me in September last year. I used the Jewish calendar. I don't use the calendar. I said, happy new year in September. Check all your industries that are thriving, like the banking sector, companies and all that. They don't close their year or begin their new year in January. They begin their new year in September, October. That period is when they start their new year. They follow the Jewish calendar. If I talk about the Jewish, you find out they're the most successful people in the world because you know they are God's own people. God made a covenant with their four forefather Abraham, he said in you shall all what be blessed. So that covenant is traveling with them. The blessing of innovation is with the Jews, the blessing of creativity of even wealth is with the Jews. So they have that calendar. That same calendar God operates is what they operate. And they understand this issue of timing so much. One day we are going to deal on Jewish codes. We will show you some of those salient codes that makes the Jews very successful. These people like Warren Buffett, people like Bill Gates, people like Matthew Beck of Facebook and the rest of them. These guys are Jewish. Thomas Edison, Michael Faraday, these are Jewish guys. I thank God you have an electrical student here so he can tell you a little about some of those adventures. It's a blessing to have. Yet you go to their nation, Israel. They don't have one deposit of a mineral resource. The whole Jerusalem, if you've been there before, is all white. Their soil is white. Actually, when they build in Jerusalem, they don't paint because the moment they build it, that their soil is automatically painted because it's white. Yet, how that nation is one of the strongest nations in this world, amazing. Is a covenant thing. It's a lesson for another day. So I understand how God operates. I use that same calendar to set my whole year. Even the whole decade, set it up. Do you know you can do the same for yourself, even while you're in school? You can set the whole four-year plan, five-year plan, depending on what you're reading. Before you graduate, what would you have done with your life? Where would you be by the time you're dropping your pen out of this place? So you're not coming out confused and misdirected, misguided. Carry CDs to any company that shows up. So of you, the goals you set is NYC. You're just a confused man. You can't wait to receive Alawi. Some of us busted that thing. So we could lay hold on the real thing. And you know some of these I'm telling you here, your lecturers will not tell you. You won't hear it in class. If I tell you the project we have, even as a ministry, I took my leader, this may help you, around the city. One particular night, we were going around the whole Abaklik, and I was forecasting to them and showing them where the new Abaklik is going to now. These other places you think Abaklik is, is no longer there. Should I say it or not? I think I should keep it. Mm-mm. It's classified. There are things you can't undo here. There are things you can't undo. Do you know, before we even came here, there are places we went to. If you see my body by the time we drove out of that place, all dusty, my shoe everywhere. Should I say what more? Let's not leave this thing here. Before they come and kidnap us. Amen. Amen. If you want to hear the things I have to tell you, come for personal mentorship. There are things I will tell you, it will wow you. I'm not a pastor like most pastors. I'm a wise builder. I'm a builder. I'm a Solomon. I'm not a... Uh, don't have time for war, for fight. I'm a Solomon. 
Do you know I can tell you what the 10 years of Weboy State is going to be? 10 years. I've seen it clearly. By studying some of the indices of development going on, I can tell you where the state is going to 10 years from now. And I can tell you what I need to be doing in this state at this time. And in the next 10 years to be a principality. Not just Neboy State, the whole southeast and even the whole southern part of Nigeria and beyond. It will take understanding maximize the potential. Putting this your life, putting a plan and putting a goal around it. That's invested life. Putting a timetable around your life. Don't just wake up like every other person wakes up. And just loaf around as though there's no direction for you. No, no, no. Live your life according to plan. According to plan. Spent life is a life that runs without a plan. Spent life is a life that runs without a guide. I don't have all the time. Number three, number three kind of life. Wasted life, wasted life. Wasted life. This is the one that is completely messed up. Because he got himself involved in all kinds of things. And then let me even shock you. Campus is where you where a lot of those wastages happen. The devil knows the power of the campus and is maximizing that power. Do you know every vice you see in the society started on campus? Hello? The campus is the factory where you manufacture a vice or a change. If you want to change your society, change the campus. If you want to destroy your society, destroy those lives on campus. Because when you are done producing, you know, change lives here, and you launch them into the society, you're going to have a changed society. But if all you have here are lives that are wasted, and you launch them into society, you're going to have the same problems. I was talking to a professor, and I asked him a question. I said, you guys are blaming government for some of the wrong things going on in the nation and all that. These guys in government said they went to school. What did you guys teach them? Beyond English language, mathematics, chemistry and all that, did you train the heart? The heart of education is the education of the heart. Did you change people's lives? Did you change people's attitude? He said, Pastor, what are you saying? I said, those your lecturers who were busy harassing those ladies in their classes to sleep with them before they get mad. What do you think they were training? Potential prostitutes. Slay mamas. I said, okay, let's bring it down to secondary school. Most secondary schools now have special centers where they age students pass exams. Yes, especially government-owned secondary schools. They sort their students out, all kinds of malpractice. It's the way you do that. Don't you know you are aiding, you are raising corrupt politicians. Politicians who will loot our treasuries. Most of our politicians have degrees, some have PhD, some have MSc, some went to, you know, good schools. But why is the effect not felt in the government? Why is the effect not felt in our society? Because once the heart is corrupted, it doesn't matter what you're training in the mind. You're going to raise an intelligent arm robber. If you have a corrupt heart, you're going to raise an intelligent prostitute. So I understand the power of campus. The power of campus. Everything the devil is doing, I can tell you much of his activity is going on here. On campus. All the crime you see in society is started from the campus. All the social vices you see is from the campus. It started. Occultism, cultism, it started from the campus and you see it manifest in society. Rape is on the campus, you see, you see it manifest in society. After every four years, you see another kind of sophisticated issue going on. Because as you're releasing this product, as you're releasing this product, the impact on the campus shows up in the society. So let me show you a few things about the wasted life. So that as you go through this phase, you are careful not to get yourself involved in those things that will ruin your life. Are you ready to hear it now? Just a few I will give you and then I will leave you here. A young man was about to be shot dead. He was involved in the bank rob. The they were about to kill him. He said, please, before you kill me, give me one minute to talk to my mother. They called the mother. He put his mouth on the mommy's ear and beat off the ear. And the woman screamed. I said, why did you do that? 
He said, yes, I have to bite your tail because you're the reason why I'm dying now. If only you told me that the way I was going was going to lead me here, I wouldn't have ended up like this. Usually when you come to school, your parents sit you down, talk to you. My child, don't do this. I know some of you, they did that for you. If they did that for both of you, they did it for me too. I have parents. They love me so much. I thank God for the role of my parents in, you know, grooming me and training me and making me successful too. They told me all that. When you go to school, make sure you don't join cults. Make sure you don't join bad boys. Don't go after girls. Get a future. Get a life and all that. They did all that for me. But you know, the moment I came into the campus, pressure came. The pressure you're going to have here that will knock off some of the things they told you at home. If you're not careful. Even the things your pastor told you at home, it will knock it off if you're not careful. There are people who came to campus decent who will leave destroyed. There are some who even gave me a very much alive who will leave dead. Depending on how you arrange yourself. Wasted life. How do you avoid wasting your life here on campus? What are those things that are likely to waste your whole life here? In my days in university, I met a young man. I won't call his name. Very young, handsome, intelligent. His father is deacon in the church. His mother is deaconess in the church. And his only child came to school. He was the guy who came after me trying to recruit me into call to call. First day he met me, he took my phone, took some of my belongings. Oh, girl, girl, you know the guy, you know the guy, you know the guy, you know the guy. Say he's late now. There's a weakness there. Younger. In fact, the day he was talking to me, he said, No, I didn't come here for all that. Too. I'm a Christian. I want to study. I want to make a first class and then serve God and make, you know. He said, Leave that thing. My papa na deacon. My mama na deaconess. I'm the only child. That guy got himself involved in some bank robbery or whatever he got himself in. They killed him, shot him, and his body was uh, deposed somewhere for weeks or running into months. The only child of a father and mother. They were looking for the boy everywhere. People came back on vacation and they were wondering, why is that son not back? I think that was his final year or third year. Final year. Shot the boy, caught activity, and then the parents came. To, went to the police, reported, came with his picture. The officers identified, okay, is this boy? Ah, uh-uh, now, we put up a mortuary since. He died in God's activity. Is he, is he, is he your son? He said, it's my son. Said, oh, very promising, handsome young man. But when he came to school, he lost a finger because of cultism. Covenant. You know, they took one of his fingers and then that's how he blended, became a cult boy and then destroyed his life for nothing. The man will leave you with HIV and AIDS. They wouldn't have gotten it even not because of campus. I met guys who told me, sir, this thing I want to leave it, but I can't leave it. I'm in covenant. I'm in covenant. Like what kind of covenant? I say blood covenant. Any day I try to leave it, they will kill me. Wasted life. Somebody who is meant to be a renowned global evangelist ended up in his early grave because of wasted life. Cultism. I've identified seven seeds that can waste people's life on campus. I will show you seven seeds. I'll just touch them and that's why I end. Seven seeds. Run away from them. I didn't come here to preach. I came here to cancel you. Run away from them. The first seed is called corrupt company. Run away. Everybody on campus is not like you. There are some people who came here with a different agenda. Some didn't come here to study. Hello? Hello? Some didn't come here for books. Some came here for different reasons. And you're going to meet such people as you go through this circle or this phase. Corrupt company. They have no home training. They don't have the fear of God. 
they have no respect for their school, no respect for their lecturers, no respect for the purpose for which they are in school. Their job is to derail and distract you. Stay away from them. Corrupt company. You never learn anything from them. Each time you come around them, what they are talking about is sex, 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 sex. What they are showing you is pornography, pornography. What they are teaching is how to masturbate. They introduce you to vices. Just like that. Whatever we saw a few minutes back, the drama. There are some people, it's not Satan that comes to them and talks to them, his friend. They just come in these guys and they begin to get you involved in some things. Corrupt company. And the scripture is clear on that. It's an evil communication, does what? Corrupts good manners. Corrupt company. If you are an ego, find ego who can struggle with them. Identify the right kind of people who bring value into your life. Not people who subtract value from you. Thank God this is Jesus here. If you have fellowship and all that. Belong to one. Belong to a church. But beyond that, look for people even amongst your fellowship members. Because some of them who are even there, there are some who are not going your direction. You must be able to identify people who are heading in your direction. Make friends with them in your classroom, in your hostel. Look for such people. And then, those ones who are not heading in your direction, stay clear. They will dig your early grave. There's a video I posted online today on Facebook. A video of a young boy who was brought into a family, you know, to be cut out for. And then he got involved with some 419 guys. And somehow they duped the master of 700 and something thousand men. And he was looking for how to solve that problem. You know what he did? He bought a sniper and put inside a pot of soup. So the master, the wife, and the child will eat and all die. Yes. Things are going on. Let me tell you. The person who is going to dig your grave is somebody you know. Somebody who knows you. Be careful who you make friends with. Some people who are agents of darkness on campus looking for who to derail. It's the story of a young lady who died a few days to her wedding. Who killed her? Friend. You must have a discerning spirit to know who is going to kill you and who is going to give life to your dream and your purpose. Contrary company will corrupt calling. Contrary company will contaminate your calling. And so you will run away from people who have no value to bring to your life, no matter how they present themselves. Look for people who invest in your positive values. Look for people who cancel you wisely. Look for people who draw you close to God. Look for people who bring you tangible substance. Substance that can help you. People who project your future. People who advance the course of your life. No people who progress you. No people who undermine your value. No people who destroy the moral fabric that you have been built with over the years. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Corrupt companies. Watch them. Number two. One of the things that can waste your life on campus. Cultism. That's the second thing. Cultism. Especially for the guys. Now I'm aware that girls also get into cultism now. In fact, it's been there. A lot of ladies are involved in God's and I know that God is of course higher with the guys. Is that correct? Watch it. God has nothing to offer you. He has nothing. You know when they come to you, they will pro- promise you protection. They promise you whatever. Like when they came to me in school. I know what they promised me. We are going to protect you because there are other called groups here. They will come after you hard. They are going to come to harass you. If you belong here, we are are going to protect you. And then you will have access to some things, you know, social life. If you want to date any girl on campus, girls like hard guys, run away from that life. There's no truth in it. Ah, girls like guys who can protect them. Run away from that. Hello? We will defend you. When there are one or two jobs, we go for some clean jobs. You make money with job. Taking another man's life is not a job, my friend. Hello? Robbing another man of his possession is not a job. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Stay clear of it. No matter how enticing they make it seem, stay clear of it. Cultism as the fastest way to dig your early grave. Whether you like it or not, the pressure will come on some of you. It will come. 
if it has not started coming, get ready. Some of you are going to have them come for you. And they will mount praise on you. They will come for the tall guys. They will come for the cute guys. Even the ladies, they will also come. But no matter the pressure they put in, that's why you must belong to a fellowship or a church. So once those things start coming, you run to your leader, your pastor, whoever you're submitting on that, and tell them in time, see what is going on. These people are coming after me. So they can join forces with you to fight that. Because you came here to get the future. Are you hear what I'm saying? You came here to get the life. You didn't come here to be carried in coffin back to your mother. You didn't come here to be carried in coffin back to your father. That's not your, that's not your end. That's not why you're here. Number three C, because of time. Cohabitation. I'm aware that you have a lot of that going on here. So, best your students be aware. In Funai, there's a lot of campus coupling. Is that correct? Plenty. You guys should go and dismantle that. Thing. In your fellowships and in your church, presence, please. Anybody in your fellowship who is not married, a student living with themselves, what is that person doing in your fellowship? I'm not saying you should send the person away, but what's the person doing there? Help that person out. That's a sin. You don't even need to be told. You don't need to tell a pastor, but it's not in the Bible. That's a complete moral decay. You know what cohabitation is? A guy who is not married, living with a girl he has not gotten married to. An unmarried lady living with an unmarried man. But you're already living as husband and wife. You even do everything that husband and wife do. In fact, I was in school one time. In this one, they would come to church. I used to think they were married. I didn't even know they were students. But they were students. They would dress in uniform. Uniform. Married or singles. Dressing in every Sunday, they were wearing uniform. Native, traditional. The way you form, and they will always sit together. Usher will give this one. He say, No way, I'm following him here. And they will go together and sit down there. When worship is going on, you need to see them lifting up hands. We glorify. You see, you know, I post I was like, Oh wow, these couples. Did I hear they were students? I see that. Students. First year students. And they lived like that for five years on campus. Five years. The lady never, she was collecting money from the parents in the name of I'm paying my hostel fee, but she was taking it to the boyfriend. Living with the boyfriend in the same house, the same room, cooking for the guy. Of course, what next would you be doing? Uh, having sex too. Hello? Hey, now you can say, no, pastor, we are keeping it holy. We just wake up in the morning, we do devotion, we look at ourselves. If we want to shake hands, we shake hands in the air. We don't even get close to each other. We only live together because, you know, the, the Bible says how good and pleasant it is. So, it will destroy you. Amen. Do you know the end of that two people today? They are both one apart. They didn't finally get married. The lady got pregnant in school. Thing dropped at 500 levels. Something got pregnant, gave birth to a baby boy or something. Two of the, both the guy and the lady got into some wahala and all that. The relationship scattered. I think the guy is not married up to now. He's out of the state. He's in Lagos. The lady herself not married. The last time I saw the lady, she was talking to me. If you see a beautiful girl. And you know when I saw that girl on campus, those that used to like her, they're like, oh my God, this lady who is married. My God, I wish you can give me this kind of girl. See how she smiles, see her dimples. If then I found that she's not married, I say, ah, ah, are you living with this guy? Okay, imagine that lady kept herself. And I saw her and I liked her the way I liked her. And then somewhere in the future, we finally got married. Do you know who that lady would have been by now? When you're living with a guy you're not married to, you are chasing potential guys out of your life. And some reasonable human beings going through this campus. Everybody didn't come here to waste their life. Oh. There are some who came here to get a real good life. And as they are going through, they see you wearing uniform with one guy you are living with. Calling him darling. Darling what? You are already preparing sandwich for him in bed. You are even doing it more than us who are married.
I know some of you are crazy, you know, you came to explore. <laughs> you love all this romance. When the, we talk about relationship, that's how the antennas in your head. So the way some of you were licking your tongue when they were talking here. Those things that are sweet are the ones that causes a lot of punching sometimes. Before I came, I said, feeling some stomach running and all, and I regret who I took ice cream. That was, you know, I stopped at a native restaurant and bought a whole cup of ice cream. And then I did a lot of wafers in it. So it was when I sat and I felt the things, so I said, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. Sweet things can make the stomach rumble. Hello? All those lovely, lovely things you're doing now, there's a time for it. I used to they dream all those things. Even when I was in school, I had a little of my own share of that experience. I used to have those that girl called right in her name. Her name is actually Choma, you know. Not the widow's Choma. Don't say ah Pastor, so you started that journey first. It's not the widow's Choma, another Choma. I used to be in love and that dear guy. Who sit down one side? That's why every day I'm in a hostel. Sometimes I'm in a lecture, lecture time is Tell me, you, do you know her? No, we used to be in school. You know, Choma came now. I think Choma came. No, Choma came before. Would you, would you? I used to. Oh, God. <laughs> the guy is so Uju. I used to think he was Uju's boyfriend those days. You need to see Uju. Uju is beautiful, man. The first place I saw was in church. One church he, he sang. She was running those ad leaves with that Maria Carey's kind of voice. And I was the one playing on the keyboard, you know. I know what you guys do. I have this happening there. They'll play, you know, Vincent will play his sax one kind like that. I look in that direction. I hope that lady is tripping. And sometimes they are playing, it's anointing. It's not anointing, it's woman. <laughs> <laughs> I know those days I'll come on the keyboard to play. I'll do a special number. No special number anything. It's the girl. I put the mic on the stand and just go there. Oh, oh yeah. I used to be a Joe Crazy fan. Joe R. Kelly, Neo, and I'll run scale. And then you see the girl saying, Oh, oh, oh. And I'll be doing like this annoying for me. Thank you, Jesus. And people be, oh, I'll do one, you hear. That was the motive. It wasn't in me. It was in God. It was Choma. It was crazy. I remember one time I even bought, there was something I did, very romantic, you know. I bought her sandals, new pairs of shoes. I bought new wristwatch, bought some fine things like that. Then I told her, come, let's take a walk. We took a walk, got into one part of the campus, very lonely. I said, you hear the birds, and then just the trees, everyone was green. And while we were walking, she didn't know I had already contracted one of my friends called Prince Will. I told him, get some bad, two bad guys, tough looking guys. And then get a lady. Let's act a drama. I said, this is what, this is what they're going to act. When you see us walking, we lay us. And then, this is what you will do. So while I was walking with her, Prince you came from the other side. And one other lady came crying. Yes, she's the one, she's the one. She was like, what is going on here? And two guys came. She said, now have this. Yeah, she's the one. He said, girl, you're on the feet. I was like, hello, guys, what's the problem? He said, if you talk, I will bust your head. Your lady, Nubia. She did date you. They chase another girl, man. I said, eh, Choma, did you do that to me? Oh my God. With all the love I have for you. Like, no, no, no. It is not true. It's not true. Prince, 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 listen, listen. Don't, don't do this. Prince, don't believe it. Don't, don't, don't believe this guy. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a fat lie. Why are you doing this? Now? You, you want to ruin, who sent you? You want to ruin my relationship, right? Prince, Prince, you know I love you. I love you. Don't, don't, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Stay away. Don't touch me. And then the little was like, shut up, shut up. You're the one who said you would kill me he, because of my guy. And then Prince was like, Kai, I will kill you today. Put this girl for ground. 
I said, no, 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 guys, guys, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't touch her. Hey, please, let me just watch them to listen. No, 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 please, it's not true. Don't let them touch me. And then, bam, on the ground. They removed her shoe. They removed her wristwatch. So I take my things out of my door. He said, shut up. Keep quiet. As we were pulling it off, the lady brought out the new shoes. The this is how we will teach you a lesson today. And they put it on her mad <laughs> The lady brought out the shoe, put it on her. Brought out the new wristwatch, put it on her. And then at that point, she was like, what, what's going on here? Somebody talked to me, what's going on here? And the priest now said, you take it. We came to teach you a lesson. And whenever you are in love with a dude like this, keep his heart because this guy loves you. Die. Yeah. And she stood up and was like, I was, I was looking at her. She was like, Prince, did, did, did you just do this? You mean you just did this? I was like, come here, baby, come here. I did this. In first year, I do am. But do you know, a day came, that lady set my heart up. She sent me a text on a Saturday night preceding a Sunday morning. I was supposed to play keyboard. And she wired me a text. Prince, as good as it feels to be with you, as nice as it feels to love you, to hang around you, all the times we talk, and blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry to tell you, I can't go on again with you. It's over. I didn't sleep in the night. I tumbled everywhere around my bed. I would turn here, turn there. The, the night was so long, I couldn't wait for the morning to dawn. I couldn't wait. Why is it over? I don't know. Was she trying to test me? I don't know. Sunday morning, I couldn't go to church. They were cutting my line. He bought this. I know, said. So my relationship is sleeping off your cutting to what, what will I do? I went looking for her in a hostel. She had already gone to church. They let it off. I can't go to church. I went to my cousin brother working in the bank at the time. My elder cousin brother. I told him, I said, I'm finished. He said, What is the problem? I said, See what is going on. He said, Calm down. I'll go and sort it out for you. That's how I stayed in the bank that whole Sunday. Until evening, he went to sort it out. The evening of that Sunday, there was a concert in church. So he said, Let's go to church to meet her. We will see her. So I went to church. I was just flowing. I stood at the front. I was waiting for her to come. I said, Where is she now? She came down, she will come. After 30 minutes, I saw her walking. The minute I saw her walking, I lifted up my hands. I knelt down. I lied under the ground and said, Lord, I love you. Jesus, you did everything to me. Anybody who saw me would think, God, this brother is in the mood of worship. He's spiritual. Lies, emotions. If God didn't rescue me from that madness, I'd have been gone. You need to see the turbulence. I faced some major turbulence that period. Major turbulence. So we finally came back. And then we had another cruise. We're cruising, enjoying ourselves, you know, loving ourselves, being very beautiful everywhere. You know, I want to hold her and show the whole world, this is my girl, she's so beautiful and all that. But see, one day, I was the one now who broke the thing. Why? Suspected, you know, that kind of thing. She lied to me about going to see her uncle and then she went to see another dude who came all the way from Lagos to see her. So when I found out I couldn't take it, I had to severe the relationship. But you know, it took me months to recover. Then you have somebody who's experienced advising you. And some of you now, if you get into this thing unprepared, it can take seven years of your future back. It can take, it can subtract major events that should be happening in your future out of your life. Because you may not have the heart to contain some of those heartbreaks and all that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Avoid cohabitation in school. You don't need relationship now. I must tell you the truth. You don't need it now. You can prepare for it. But you don't need to be in one now. There's something like, Pastor, we are, we are just trying to test the waters to see if there's future, if there's hope. Don't test anything. You'll get drunk. Cohabitation. Maybe you are here, you have a guy living in your hostel as a lady. Tell the guy, Oga, Oga, Oya, 
see the, the door. Go to your own hostel. Or go and rent yourself a new hostel. You're not needed here anymore. You're a guy, you're living, or you're a girl, you're living with a guy. Pack your things gently. The guy doesn't have the moral stamina to tell you to leave. Pack your things. Then, brother, you know, I, I'm so excited meeting you. I, I like the fact I'm able to feel the way I feel for you. But please, for the sake of the future, your own future and my own future, I've got to leave here. Don't drive guys who you would have met in the future who would have been big boys proposing to you but because of your lifestyle on campus you sent all of them away because they knew the way you lived your life the way you polluted your life and all that. Can I show you just the remaining four I mentioned if I can't finish it then we just go from here. You know um, I feel like we should stop Just watch the time and then you know we have shot that much. Take this three and go, don't worry. We'll do the remaining for some other times. I feel the body to pray for you. Passionately pray for you. None of you who just matriculated will suffer defeat on this campus. Feel the body. Stand on your feet everywhere you are. God, you are hearing what you are hearing now, and thank God you are alive to hear these things. Some of us heard them somewhere, you know. Yes, I knew I had a feeling, I had a passion, I had a dream, I had a vision, but I didn't know how to go about it until certain directions came my way and all that. When I matriculated, I didn't have any program like this. However, thank God I'm where I am today. You have a timely opportunity to make a quick start and begin that journey into your promised land. I want you to talk to God by yourself in a few minutes. Just bow your heads and talk to God. Tell God something, Lord. Thank you, first of all, for the things I have heard. Thank you for the insights. Thank you for the revelations. I believe somebody here is taking something back home. It's not about shouting. We didn't come here for that. When we will shout and scream, I will come back. We will come back for Revival Summit. That's when we will do all that. I came here to guide you so you don't make some mistakes that will cost you things in your future. I surrender to you.
nothing. One more time, we hope. to begin that journey of an invested life I want you to connect with your creator in a few minutes talk to your father Lord show me great and mighty things about my future which I know not show me great and mighty things about my life I know not Lord open the portal for Lord to me the blueprints the blueprints for my life my purpose, my assignment, my calling. Then maybe you're here, you've not yet known Jesus. It's an opportunity to ask the Lord to give you a revelation of Him. Let me hear you lift your voices and talk to your father. If you can pray the right tongues, say of the gift of God in you. Pray the right tongues right now. Sate parato sapande. Pando sate rabate 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 Sade <laughs> Now listen. The Bible says, and you shall receive power on high after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Listen to me. Some of you We believe you've been transformed by the wonders of God's Word. For additional information about us, you can visit our website at www.princetonhills.org. You can also send us a mail at info at princetonhills.org or call 070-331-66762 or 081-31-555-747. Princeton Hills Ministries, Raising Global Global Leaders.